Hello and welcome to another EduMed video. This is the, another video in the series that we've made on airway pressure release ventilation or APRV. In this particular video, we'll talk about how to manage a patient who's hypoxic on APRV and how you can change your settings to manage the hypoxia. We'll just briefly give an overview of what APRV is, but again, it's worth going to the first of this series of videos to um, get a bit more of an in-depth knowledge of this. We'll then talk a little bit about oxygenation um, and a little bit about CO2 removal, and importantly, what things can you adjust on APRV to improve the oxygenation if a patient is hypoxic. As I said with all of these videos in the APRV series, it is worth going back and seeing some of my videos on the basics of ventilation because you will get a much better understanding of what we are talking about. But the central thesis of ventilation and oxygenation comes down to this picture. All you need to understand is that the only two components to get oxygenation and removal of CO2 is to have an alveolus that is getting air moving in and out of it that is oxygen rich and having a blood flow to that alveolus that is carrying deoxygenated blood and able to take out oxygenated blood. That is it. <clears throat> As I've said in many of my other videos, the most important part of oxygenation is four different aspects. And these are the only four aspects that you can do something about to try and improve blood oxygenation without having to move to extracorporeal methods of oxygenation, such as ECMO. The most obvious is the increase in the fractional inspired oxygen concentration. What positive pressure ventilation is all about is trying to recruit up and open up as many additional alveoli as possible, which are collapsed either through infection or um, through lots of fluids, such as with pulmonary edema. That is why we move from giving people a face mask with oxygen through to intubating them and giving them positive pressure ventilation. Because the improvement that you see is because we just expand up and open up a lot more alveoli and therefore improve the flow of oxygen into the bloodstream. Alveolar blood flow is really important. If you think back to the picture that I showed you on the previous slide, there are only two components to the lung, the alveolus and the capillary. People often forget to think about the perfusion and so matching ventilation to perfusion, but that is so vital. And so if you over distend an alveolus, for example, you can put pressure on the alveolar capillaries and therefore increase resistance and reduce blood flow through them. And that can in and of itself reduce oxygenation. And so it's really important to both maximize the right-sided cardiac output, but also to try and minimize the pressure that you're um, exerting on the right ventricle and therefore reducing blood flow through the lungs. The treatments that we give in intensive care to treat the underlying pathology are the things that we use to try and improve the alveolar blood interface. So this is where things like diuretics to reduce the edema in the lungs and antibiotics to reduce the infection and thus pus and exudate in the lungs are really important in the long-term improvement of the patient. APRV, as we said before, is essentially extreme CPAP. So you can see why it's really helpful in patients who have a severe hypoxia, because what you're trying to do in this mode of ventilation is recruit up multiple alveoli that are collapsed due to infection or due to pressure on the mediastinal organs or through the diaphragm with the abdominal contents pushing up and collapsing the bases. So APRV is really a mode to try and improve recruitment of lung and therefore increase the number of alveolar units that are able to partake in oxygen diffusion into the blood. As we said before, there are only a certain number of settings that you have to have in APRV. 
The most obvious is the fractional inspired concentration of oxygen, as with any ventilatory mode. The bits that are slightly different are there are two different pressures that you set, which are akin to the P insp, or the inspiratory pressure, and the PEEP that you have in conventional ventilation. But in this case, it's called P high, and that is effectively the amount of CPAP that you're giving the patient. And the P low is the pressure at which you let it release, and those releases are there to try and improve carbon dioxide release through the bulk flow of gases. Again, go back to my first video to have a bit more explanation of what that's all about. And then the times that you're keeping the high pressure and the low pressure are the two other settings that you have. So let's think a little bit about a patient who is hypoxic on APRV. So what can you change? The common scenario is that you've started a patient on APRV and then for whatever reason they've deteriorated a little bit and so they, the nurse at the bedside calls you to say that the patient is hypoxic, can you do something about it? The most easy option is to increase the fractional inspired oxygen concentration and that is often the first thing that you do with any emergency where a patient is hypoxic is that you increase the oxygen now, the reason why we can't just leave patients on 60, 70, 80, 100% oxygen is that it can increase oxidative stress on the lungs. And there is quite good in vitro and in vivo evidence that high fractional inspired concentrations of oxygen can be very damaging to the lung epithelium, causing a lot of oxidative stress. And so we try to keep the FiO2 below 60%. So in the short term, it's a great thing, but we want to try and rapidly wean patients off a high fracture inspired concentration of oxygen. So how do we do that? It comes back to that simple thing of trying to open up as many alveoli as possible. And so that is the strategy that you need to think about. So quite obviously, if you've got lung that is all collapsed up, and say, for example, it's thickened with lots of inflammation around it. So it might need a pressure of 25 centimetres of water to actually open it up. Now, if you're only providing 20 centimetres of water, obviously there are going to be some lung units that aren't opening up. So the first thing that you could do is to increase up your P high. That is the high pressure that you, uh, that you leave the lung at to open up all the alveolar units. Again, remember, all you need for oxygen diffusion into the blood is you need the alveolus to be open and getting gas coming into it, which is fresh and full of oxygen. So first thing that you can do is to increase the P high because you might be able to recruit some areas of lung that are collapsed down and need that slightly higher pressure to open them up. The second thing that you can do is to increase your T high. So this is the amount of time that you've kept the lung at that high pressure. Inevitably, with every release of breath, um, what you're going to be doing is reducing the pressure down, and therefore some of those alveoli that might need that high pressure to keep them open might just collapse down. And if they're collapsing down, then they're not partaking in oxygenation. So you could increase the P high, and you could increase the T high, the time that it's at that high pressure. The other thing that you can do is to adjust the T low. This is the amount of time that the um, ventilator goes down to the low pressure. If you remember back to the first video, we said that the, T, the P low, so the pressure low that is set, is always zero or as low as the ventilator will allow you to go. Now, I want you to have a look at the graph that you see on the bottom there. So this is pressure and time. <clears throat> and what you can see is the blue line is the pressure that's monitored by the ventilator end. And you can see that it's set at a P high and then it drops down for a period of time and then it goes back up again. The dotted line is actually the pressure that's in the lungs. They are two different things. And this is one of the nuances of APRV. The reason you set these very short times that the um, ventilator drops down the pressure to its pressure low is because 
it's too short for all the lung to collapse down. So the pressure inside the lung actually doesn't drop down to what you've set it at, at the ventilator. It actually drops down only a short, a small amount, just enough for some gas to escape, and then the pressure goes back up again to the pressure high level. And so you are effectively maintaining all of the lung open and just releasing everything to just shiver down for a second and then come back up again. If you extend that time low too much, then you're going to allow more collapsing of lung units. So the other thing that you can do is actually reduce your time at the low pressure. Some people mistakenly think that you should increase your pressure low, that you should put it up, so effectively using it like PEEP. That can actually paradoxically impair carbon dioxide removal. The reason you set it to the lowest possible pressure is things will flow down a pressure gradient. And what we want during our pressure releases is for gas to come out of the lung as quick as possible. And so you want the pressure differential between what's in the lungs and the ventilator to be as great high as possible. And that is why we use um, a pressure of zero if we can make it, because then that gives the least resistance to gas coming out and therefore the most amount of um, the gas inside the lungs to release with every drop of pressure. The way in which we keep recruitment and therefore the pressure in the lungs isn't modulated by the pressure that we set on the ventilator, it's modulated by how quickly you release. If you imagine you release at just over a nanosecond, almost no drop in pressure is going to be seen in the lungs. And so you can see how by shortening the T low, the time that it's the low pressure, you can actually maintain the alveolar recruitment, more alveolar rem remain open, and therefore you're going to maintain oxygenation throughout a longer period of time in more alveoli. Obviously, nothing comes for free. By reducing that T low, you can potentially reduce the amount of gas that's exhaled out with each release and therefore the carbon dioxide levels might go up. We'll go through how to manage hypercapnia in a second talk. Essentially, what I hope I've shown in this video is how to manage a patient who's on APRV who becomes hypoxic. Obviously, anyone can change the FiO2. If you're already at the limit of 100%, that's not really an option. But also, we've mentioned that if it's above 60%, really, that can be quite damaging to the lungs. So we want to try and use other techniques to reduce the amount of uh, oxygen that we're actually giving the lungs. So the things that we can do are increase the high pressure to try and recruit up more um, units of lung. We can increase the T high, so the time that it's at that high pressure, to maintain as many alveolar units open as possible, and decrease the time that it's at the low pressure to as little as possible to allow efficient oxygenation for as long as possible without those alveolar units all collapsing down during the release phase. I hope that was useful. If you have any questions, please post them in the questions below and I can produce another video with any questions that you may have. Please, if you've liked this video, like it, subscribe to my channel and um, hit the bell notification. There's going to be a lot of these videos coming out over the next few months. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time.